The war in Ukraine is not simply a war between Russia and Ukraine. From the very beginning of this conflict that really goes back to 2014, it's been quite clear that this is a proxy war between Russia and NATO. And really, because NATO is led by the United States, it's really a proxy war between Russia and the United States. You can't understand the conflict in Ukraine unless you go back to the coup in 2014 in February, that a violent coup led by far-right extremists that overthrew the democratically elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, who had an independent foreign policy and was trying to balance the West with Russia. He was overthrown and a pro-Western regime was installed and this set off a civil war. I myself published a report looking at a document that was written by the US ambassador to Russia back in 2008. His name was William Burns. Today, he is CIA director. And in this State Department cable that we have, thanks to WikiLeaks, William Burns, the US ambassador to Russia turned CIA director, warned, he said that if Ukraine joins NATO, there are fears that the issue could potentially split the country in two, leading to violence or even some claim civil war, which would force Russia to decide whether to intervene. So members of the US government, top level officials have known for years that this conflict, the US policy of NATO expansion surrounding Russia would potentially set off a civil war in Ukraine that could lead to a broader war. And we have more and more evidence showing that the U.S. government is not only supporting Ukraine with tens of billions of dollars of weapons, but the U.S. is in many ways leading Ukraine, directing war, Ukraine in this war, this proxy war against Russia, the U.S. military, and also the CIA. The notorious U.S. spy agency is involved in every facet of this proxy war. And a new report shows that the CIA is actually using another member of NATO that is located in Europe to launch sabotage operations against infrastructure inside Russia. And we know this because of a report that was published by a U.S. journalist who is himself very close to the U.S. intelligence agencies and the U.S. military. His name is Jack Murphy. Jack Murphy is a former U.S. military special operations officer, and he became a journalist. He's a pretty mainstream journalist, and he has a very good report in which he details the role of the CIA and an allied intelligence agency based in a European NATO member. And they're working together to launch sabotage operations inside Russia territory, Russian territory, destroying railroads, destroying uh, power facilities, uh, cutting cables, cutting power, blowing up military facilities or setting them on fire. So this is a clear example of the United States, of the CIA, quite directly waging war on Russia inside its own territory. And this is the latest example of a growing mountain of evidence proving that this conflict, as I said, is not a war simply between Russia and Ukraine. It is a war between Russia and NATO, between Russia and the United States. Now, I'm going to go through this report. I'm going to talk about the very important revelations in it. But before I, I want to review some statements that have been made by Western officials that show just how dangerous this proxy war is. Because although the United States is involved in basically every single way in this war, the U.S. military does not technically have forces on the ground in Russia, but that could happen and it could escalate to a full on conventional direct war between the U.S. and Russia as opposed to an indirect war like it is now. And this has been acknowledged by the leader of NATO. And this was reported in the Associated Press on December 9th in an article titled NATO chief fears Ukraine war could become wider conflict. It quotes the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, and the AP reported that the head of NATO expressed worry that the fighting in Ukraine could spin out of control and become a war between Russia and NATO, which, as I said, that's what it already is, at least indirectly and in some ways directly. But 
he himself acknowledged that this could escalate further and it's very dangerous. And Jen Stoltenberg said, it is a terrible war in Ukraine. It is also a war that can become a full-fledged war that spreads into a major war between NATO and Russia. He added, there is no doubt that a full-fledged war is a possibility. So instead of simply being a proxy war, NATO is saying that this could become a full-on conventional war between the US and Russia, between NATO and Russia. There was a very similar and very concerning comment made by the commander of US Strategic Command, which is known as STRATCOM. And this is the branch, the part of the US military that oversees nuclear weapons. So this is a huge concern considering the threat of nuclear war. Of course, the US and Russia are the two largest nuclear armed powers in the world. And this was reported at the US Department of Defense on November 3rd. It quotes Navy Admiral Charles A. Richard, the commander of STRATCOM. He said, quote, this Ukraine crisis that we're in right now, this is just the warm up. The big one is coming and it isn't going to be very long before we're going to get tested in ways that we haven't been tested in a long time. So very concerning remarks. You could say this is maybe an act of psychological warfare, trying to threaten Russia with a hint of nuclear war. But it's also real. This proxy war could escalate further into a very dangerous direct conventional war. So today in this analysis, I'm going to look at mainstream media reports that have been in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, showing the hand of the CIA and the US military and other European militaries and intelligence agencies in fueling this war, directly participating in this proxy war. The New York Times had an article about the involvement of US Special Operations Forces and the CIA and Western militaries that was published in June and it acknowledged that the war in Ukraine is a proxy war. Yahoo News has had a series of articles detailing this going back to even before Russia invaded Ukraine in February. Yahoo News published an article in January titled CIA trained Ukrainian paramilitaries may take central role if Russia invades. They also published a very similar report in March after Russia invaded titled secret CIA training program in Ukraine helped Kiev prepare for Russian invasion. So there have been mainstream media outlets that have acknowledged this. But now I want to go back to this report by the U.S. Special Operations Officer turned journalist Jack Murphy and look at some of the details that he revealed. Now, who is Jack Murphy? He published a book called Murphy's Law in which he talks, it's a memoir, he talks about his life as a former army ranger sniper and special operations weapons sergeant sergeant turned journalist. So he was a US military officer who was involved in US special operations. And I wanna be very clear, he is not in any way a pro-Russian journalist. He in many ways is pro-Ukrainian and he's very close to the US military and US intelligence agencies. And he's an example of one of these journalists that you could say plays a role as a kind of limited hangout. He will sometimes release information about US military operations and intelligence operations that can be potentially convenient for the US government in some ways and can be part of the information war and the psychological war against Russia, right? But he also is a, he's a genuine journalist. He's done some good work. And in this case, he wrote an article that mainstream media outlets refused to publish. So he had no option but to publish it at his website. And this was acknowledged by the journalist Seth Harp. Seth Harp is himself another US military veteran who fought in the Iraq war, and he's become a journalist as well. And he's also close to the military, but he's done some good reporting, especially on the proxy war in Ukraine. And Seth Harp has detailed how The U.S. military is involved in the proxy war in Ukraine, basically in every single way possible up to the point of having U.S. military forces directly on the ground. I mean, that's basically that's the only further way that it could escalate. The U.S. is involved in every other way in this proxy war. And 
Seth Harp pointed out when he shared this article, he pointed out that no fewer than three major national publications killed this deeply reported and well-sourced story by Jack Murphy under pressure from the CIA. So it's likely Seth Harp didn't disclose his sources, but it's likely Jack Murphy told him or someone in, those, in the circle, this circle, you know, of U.S. military veterans who became journalists and they're still, they have one foot in the U.S. military world and one foot in the journalistic world. It's likely that someone revealed to him that Jack Murphy could not get this, story, this article published in a mainstream media outlet. So he was forced to publish it at his website. But again, I want to be clear. Jack Murphy is not pro-Russian. He's not certainly not pro-Putin. In fact, if you go to his Twitter account, you can see he's at Jack Murphy RGR. You can see that he often criticizes Putin. He criticizes Russia. He criticizes people who are accused of being supposed apologists for Russia. Here, here's a tweet from him in February. He said, enjoying the NATO forced Putin to invade copium on this website. Good luck with this mental gymnastics. Of course, he's ignoring that 2008 embassy cable that I talked about from the U.S. ambassador to Russia turned CIA director William Burns. So I guess now we're supposed to believe that CIA director William Burns, who's overseeing this sabotage operation targeting Russia, is supposedly involved in mental gymnastics because he admitted that the NATO expansion up to Ukraine could force Russia to intervene and could set off a civil war in Ukraine, which is exactly what happened. And here he's another, here's another tweet from him. He says, the, Pu the Putin is winning people sound like the QAnon people the day Biden was inaugurated. And he's constantly criticized Putin, making fun of people who say he's a chess master. And he said, uh, basically, the only way to end this war is Putin leaving. He said, let Putin find his own off ramp. It isn't our job to provide him with one. He showed himself into Ukraine and can show himself out with a 50% smaller military if need be. And he's constantly criticizing. He said, Putin is a wimp and a crybaby. You're not being canceled. You're losing a war. He's a parody of himself. And Jack Murphy has opposed calls for uh, a diplomatic end to this war, saying that Putin should lose the war militarily. So I just wanted to show those tweets to make it clear that when I go through this article, this is not a pro-Russian journalist, whatever that means. This is someone who is a U.S. military veteran, who's close to U.S. military circles and U.S. intelligence circles, and he has genuine sources inside those communities, which is why this article can be convenient, because we know that this is not someone who's antagonistic to, to, to the U.S. government. So... Let's go through this report here and the main points. So he, he says, he writes, the CIA is using a European NATO allies spy service to conduct a covert sabotage campaign inside Russia under the agency's direction. The campaign involves longstanding sleeper cells that the allied spy service has activated to hinder Moscow's invasion of Ukraine by waging a secret war behind Russian lines. Years in the planning, the campaign is responsible for many of the unexplained explosions and other mishaps that have befallen the Russian military industrial complex since Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine in February. As examples of targets of infrastructure in Russia that have been sabotaged in unexplained incidents, he notes that railway bridges, fuel depots, and power plants have been attacked. Now, Jack Murphy notes in this report that technically no U.S. personnel are directly on the ground in Russia, but he says that the CIA and its paramilitary officers are commanding and controlling the sabotage operations, and the CIA paramilitary officers are assigned to the agency's special activity center, and they're working in the CIA's European mission center, and they're using an allied intelligence service in a NATO European state. And that he said that he notes that that was necessary in order to give the CIA a layer of plausible deniability because U.S. President Joe Biden demanded that in order to approve the sabotage operations inside Russian territory. Now, in this report, Jack Murphy does not disclose what European NATO member is working with the CIA on this and which European country has its forces on the ground in Russia. I think because of 
information in this report, especially his discussion of how some of these uh, CIA assets have been crossing the Russian border back into, into other parts of Europe. To that, to me, suggests that it's a country that's very close to Russia. So I think that that means it's probably a Baltic state, maybe Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, or Pol Poland. I think those are the most likely possibilities. He also talks about sabotage. The CIA has carried out sabotage operations in Belarus, and Poland borders Belarus. So those are the most likely countries, but we don't have the exact names of what these countries are. Now, in this article, Jack Murphy points out that the U.S. government, uh, that President Barack Obama, he signed authorization for the U.S. the U.S. intelligence agencies to carry out covert sabotage operations against Russia before Obama left office in January 2017. And Obama specifically authorized a scheme to plant cyber weapons in Russia's infrastructure. This was disclosed by the Washington Post in a report back in June 2017 titled Obama's Secret Struggle to Punish Russia for Putin's Election Assault. And this is, of course, based on the conspiracy theory that Russia meddled in the 2016 U.S. elections to get Donald Trump elected. This is the whole Russiagate conspiracy. Obviously, you know, that's very shady and it's mostly been proven to be false. But this article does disclose this very inf 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 interesting and important information that the Obama administration secretly debated dozens of options for deterring or punishing Russia, including cyber attacks on Russian infrastructure, the release of CIA gathered material that might embarrass Putin and sanctions that officials said could crater the Russian economy. In December 2016, a month before Obama left office, he approved, message, uh, he approved measures that included punishing Russia by expelling diplomats and closing Russian compounds, as well, as well as economic sanctions on Russia. And here's the most important part of this report in the Washington Post, that Obama also approved a previously undisclosed covert measure that authorized planting cyber weapons in Russia's infrastructure, the digital equivalent of bombs that could be detonated if the United States found itself in an escalating exchange with Moscow. And obviously that has happened. That is the situation we're in now with the escalation of the proxy war in Ukraine, which was started by the Obama administration when the U.S. government backed the coup in Ukraine in 2014 that was largely overseen by the State Department official Victoria Nuland, a hardline anti-Russian hawk, neoconservative figure married to Robert Kagan, the notorious neoconservative leader. And Victoria Nuland was recorded in a leaked phone call speaking with the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine in which she, she handpicked who the leader of Ukraine, the prime minister of Ukraine would be after the U.S.-backed coup. And she said, Yats is our guy, referring to a right-wing Ukrainian politician named Ar Ar Artsenya Yatsenyuk. And he is exactly who became prime minister of Ukraine after the U.S.-backed coup. So the Washington Post points out that Obama approved this operation for sabotage, and it was still in the planning stage when he left office, but clearly... It was continued, especially by the Biden administration. Biden, of course, being Obama's former vice president. So let's go back to this report now from Jack Murphy, the U.S. special operations officer turned journalist. Now, in this article, he points out a very important detail that the CIA has publicly denied involvement in these sabotage operations inside Russian territory. However, Jack Murphy points out that under Title 50 of the U.S. Code, which authorizes covert actions, the CIA can lawfully deny the existence of these operations to everyone except the so-called Gang of Eight, which include top U.S. government officials such as the chairman and ranking minority members of the Congressional Intelligence Committees, Speaker of the House, and the leaders of the Senate. So the CIA can legally lie in public it can legally deny the existence of its co op covert operations. It can lie to the media. It can lie to anyone else except the top officials of the U.S. government. So when the CIA denies involvement, I mean, that, that means nothing. So 
Jack Murphy points out that the, the, the NATO allies campaign overseen by the CIA is only one of several covert operations being undertaken by Western nations inside Russia. Other European intelligence services has, have activated long dormant resistance networks in their own countries, who in turn have been running operatives into Russia to create chaos without CIA help. And Ukrainian intelligence and special operations forces are running their own operations behind Russian lines. So again, this is not simply a war between Russia and Ukraine. This is a war between Russia and NATO. Not only the U.S. and the CIA, but also European countries are similarly running operations of sabotage and attacks inside Russian territory. And I want to point out that this is this was revealed in the New York Times article that I discussed earlier. This is a New York Times article published in June. It's titled Commando Network Coordinates Flow of Weapons in Ukraine. And I'm going to read a few quotes from this New York Times report. Again, this is the New York Times. It's basically U.S. state media. The New York Times reported that Ukraine's ability to resist the Russian invasion depends more than ever on help from the United States and its allies, including a stealthy network of commandos and spies rushing to provide weapons, intelligence, and training, according to U.S. and European officials. Much of this work happens outside Ukraine at bases in Germany, France, and Britain. Some CIA personnel have continued to operate in Ukraine secretly, mostly in the capital, Kiev, directing much of the vast amounts of intelligence the United States is sharing with Ukrainian forces. A few dozen commandos from other NATO countries, including Britain, France, Canada, and Lithuania, also have been working inside Ukraine, and they are training and advising Ukrainian troops and providing an on-the-ground conduit for weapons and other aid. The New York Times added that shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine in February, the Army's 10th Special Forces Group, that's the U.S. Army's 10th Special Forces Group, which before the war had been training Ukrainian commandos at a base in the country's west, quietly established a coalition planning cell in Germany to coordinate military assistance to Ukrainian commandos and other Ukrainian troops. That cell has now grown to 20 nations. So this is a war between, a proxy war between Russia and 20 nations, Western nations in NATO. This is a massive proxy war. It's not simply Russia versus Ukraine. I also mentioned this report from January in Yahoo News that was published before Russia invaded. It said the CIA is overseeing a secret intensive training program in the U.S. for elite Ukrainian special operations forces and other intelligence personnel. The program started in 2015 under the Obama administration, and it's based at an undisclosed facility in the southern United States. It was later reported that it's based in Georgia. And the CIA trained forces could soon play a critical role on Ukraine's eastern border if Russia invades. They, know that they noted that the covert CIA program, which is run by paramilitaries working for the agency's ground branch, officially known as the ground department, was established by the Obama administration after Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. What they don't mention is that Russia responded to that because it was a response to the U.S. organized coup in Ukraine in 2014 that overthrew Ukraine's democratically elected government. And Russia had a democratic referendum in which more than 90 percent of people in Crimea who were historically had been part of Russia and speak Russia, Russian, the Russian language and are ethnically Russian, over 90 percent of them joined to become part of the Russian Federation. And even Western polling firms like Pew Research acknowledge that the vast majority of people in Crimea wanted to become part of Russia, as they historically had been. So the CIA operation for Ukrainians was begun under Obama in, in 2015, and then it expanded under Trump, and then the Biden administration has further expanded it. And by 2015, as part of this CIA effort, it had paramilitaries also traveling to the front lines in Eastern Europe, sorry, in Eastern Ukraine to advise Ukrainian officials in the proxy war between the West and Russia that, were, that was happening in Donbass. So the CIA was on the front lines in Eastern Ukraine by 2015. And that's just what's been disclosed, maybe even earlier. And Yahoo News pointed out that 
The U.S.-based CIA program has included training in firearms, camouflage techniques, land navigation, tactics like cover and move, intelligence, and other areas. And finally, I want to go back to this rep other report in Yahoo News published in March, which is about a secret CIA training program in Ukraine helping Kiev prepare for the Russian invasion. This article reveals that, in fact, the CIA has been training forces in Ukraine since 2014, not 2015, since 2014. And it notes that as the battle lines hardened in Donbass in East Ukraine, a small select group of veteran CIA paramilitaries made their first secret trips to the front lines to meet with Ukrainian counterparts. So as soon, right after the US-backed coup in Ukraine in 2014, the CIA began traveling to Ukraine to train Ukrainian forces to fight a proxy war against Russia. And they noted that the, the, the covert CIA tra training program was run from East Ukraine's eastern front lines. As part of the Ukraine-based training program, CIA paramilitaries taught their Ukrainian counterparts sniper techniques, how to operate US-supplied Javelin anti-tank missiles and other equipment, how to evade digital tracking the Russians used to pinpoint the location of Ukrainian troops, how to use covert communications tools, how to remain undetected in the war zone while drawing out Russian and insurgent forces from their positions, among other skills. After Russia's 2014 incursion, the U.S. military also helped run a long-standing publicly acknowledged training program for Ukrainian troops in the country's western region. So while the U.S. military was training Ukrainian troops in the west of Ukraine, the CIA was training Ukrainian forces in the eastern part of Ukraine in order to wage a proxy war on Russia. And that goes back to 2014, right after the U.S. backed coup in Ukraine in 2014. So now I know that's a lot of information. There's a lot of there's a lot of reports. I, I acknowledge all of the sources will be available in an article that I published at multipolarista.com. And I will link to that in the description below. You can find links to every single source I discuss in this video and in this podcast today. And I will, of course, also link to the article that was published by the journalist, the U.S. Special Operations Force officer turned journalist Jack Murphy at his website so you can get access to all of this information. So let's go back to this original article that I was discussing that was written by Jack Murphy about the CIA overseeing a sabotage operation inside Russian territory. So this article quotes a former CIA paramilitary officer, and we know what they say about so-called former CIA. There's no such thing as former CIA. They're, for, they're basically lifelong CIA. So this former CIA paramilitary officer, Mick Mulroy, he said that the sabotage operations in Russian territory, he said their value is substantial and serves multiple forces. Russia has had a significant problem keeping up with its logistical supply lines. These, attack, these attacks further complicate its effort to supply its forces. Then uh, this journalist, Jack Murphy, also quoted a former US military official who said, with sabotage and subversion, there is a psychological component. And then he quoted a think tank analyst at a neoconservative anti-Russian think tank called the Center for European Policy Analysis, which is a basically a NATO think tank. It's funded by the U.S. State Department. And this analyst said, quote, there have been many fires across Russia over the past few months, particularly in weapons manufacturing plants and other crucial sites. As an example, in April, a Russian aerospace defense forces building was burned burned down. Other, sab other sabotage targeting infrastructure in Russia has included the cutting of rail lines and power lines. And in this article, Jack Murphy includes uh, screenshots of photos from a U.S. military sabotage manual that teaches people in the U.S. military how to sabotage railroads and other infrastructure in countries like Russia. And he has multiple screenshots from this U.S. military sabotage manual. So it's very clearly very clear that the U.S. government 
has carried out these kinds of operations for a long time and is doing it against Russia today. Now, going back to this article, Jack Murphy notes that the European NATO countries allied spy service had placed some of the caches of explosives and gear used by these sleeper cells inside Russia more than a decade previously. And in 2014, the CIA began planning with the Allied Spy Service to push more operatives into Russia with orders to lay low until they were needed. So these are sleeper cells, right? And the first of these sleeper cells under the combined control of the CIA and the spy service of the European NATO country, they infiltrated into Russia in 2016, and they created an extensive network of front companies that were used to fund and support these behind the lines operations. Some of them go back almost 20 years. So this Western sabotage targeting Russia is not new. After the 2016 infiltrations, more Western teams slipped into Russia over the next several years. Some smuggled in new munitions. So the CIA and this other European country, they are smuggling in weapons, explosives, and materials for sabotage to these sleeper cells going back years. So two days before Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, the CIA and the NATO spy service, they sent communications telling their sleeper cells across Russia to activate. So they knew that Russia was about to invade. And those CIA-backed cells discreetly moved to the locations of buried munitions in caches around Russia, and they dug up explosives and other materiel needed for the upcoming sabotage operations. Some of the first sabotage attacks behind Russian lines occurred actually outside Russia in Belarus, which is a neighbor of Russia and an ally of Russia. And this was acknowledged in the Washington Post. This article published in the Washington Post is titled The Belarusian Railway Saboteurs Who Helped Thwart Russia's Attacks on Kiev. And it's by another journalist who's an ally of Western spy agencies who is involved in spreading propaganda about the proxy war in Syria. Her name is Liz Sly. And, and Sly Liz, she wrote, a clandestine network of railway workers, hackers, and dissident security forces wreaked havoc on supply lines in Belarus. She noted that starting in the earliest days of the Russian invasion in February, a clandestine network of railway workers, hackers, and dissident security forces went into action to disable or disrupt the railway links connecting Russia to Ukraine through Belarus, wreaking havoc on supply lines. These US-backed saboteurs targeted the signal control cabinets essential to the functioning of the railways. For days on end, the movement of trains were paralyzed, forcing the Russians to attempt to resupply their troops by road. So once again, the US is backing sabotage operations inside foreign countries' territories, not only Russia, but also Belarus. So going back to this article from Jack Murphy, he notes that some of the teams overseen by the CIA and the NATO sp allies spy service have moved back and forth across international borders to collect more munitions and to conduct mission rehearsals. That to me suggests that the NATO European ally is probably a country that's close to Russia, likely a Baltic state, which could be Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania, or Poland, as I said. And the fact that they, they started their, their sabotage operations inside Belarus before going into Russia suggests that maybe it's Poland. Poland is a member of NATO and the EU, and Poland is a neighbor of Belarus. And Poland, of course, is run, has a far-right, viciously anti-Russian and anti-Belarusian government. Okay, so it's not just the CIA, by the way. Also, the, also JSOC, which is the U.S. Military Special Operations Forces, have supported sabotage operations in Russia with targeting information from intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms such as drones that can see and hear deep into Russia. So it's both the, the CIA and the Pentagon carrying out or uh, backing these sabotage operations in Russian territory. And 
this, this official, this anonymous official who knew about the operation told Jack Murphy that these elite teams are always given air surveillance support for major sabotage ops behind Russian lines. Drones we don't even know about yet are loitering all over the Ukrainian and Russian airspace. And here, Jack Murphy points out the historical context. This is not the first time at all that the CIA has carried out sabotage operations. It's been doing it since the CIA was founded in 1947. During the first Cold War, the CIA carried out sabotage in Cuba, Vietnam, and throughout Central America. Of course, the Contras, the far-right death squads that were armed and trained and created by the CIA, they carried out sabotage. They blew up hospitals, burned down hospitals and schools, and they blew up bridges, and they put mines in Nicaragua's ports and killed thousands of civilians. So these kinds of terror operations, that's what they are, have been carried out by the CIA for decades, targeting many countries. And Jack Murphy points out that, that these CIA operations were also part of its plans for Western Europe, should the Soviet Union ever have invaded. And this is, of course, known as Operation Gladio, the NATO Stay Behind Networks. He mentions those NATO Stay Behind Networks. And actually, Jack Murphy published a tweet, Twitter thread about this. And I'm not going to read all the Twitter thread because it's long, but he, he points out that well, he spent months working on this article about the CIA uh, sabotage operations inside Russia. He, he did a lot of research and he found a lot of information that he couldn't put in the story, including one about the CIA and NATO stay behind paramilitary elements in Europe. And he said they were falsely believed to have closed for business around 1994, but they were not closed. The stay behind networks are mostly known from the Italian network Gladio. He said, to this day, we still don't know what the actual NATO program name is and was. Stay Behind is known as the fourth infiltration method in special operations. You can enter enemy territory by land, sea, air, or by creating sleeper cells that go to ground and wait for the enemy to invade. Then they activate to begin conducting acts of sabotage and espionage. The Gladio network, he claims that it was hijacked by criminal elements. That's part of this, you know, limited hangout. In reality, the CIA knew that was working with the mafia and criminal elements. It was not hijacked. It was the CIA who was willingly, and NATO who was willingly going along with criminal elements. He points out that it was thought that this ended around 1994. However, Western governments have continued running similar sabotage operations since then. So it did not end in 1994. He points out in his article, we're back to his website now, which is jackmurphywrites.com. I'll link to it in the description below. He points out that the current campaign of sabotage inside Russia bears a closer resemblance to CI operations ahead of the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. And that in before the U.S. invaded Iraq, the CIA ground branch paramilitary forces, they trained 70 Kurdish cells and then deployed them into Iraqi territory, blowing up infrastructure. So the CIA has an operation of working with Kurdish groups in West Asia. So when you see, you know, uh, the accusations of Kurdish groups carrying out uh, terror attacks and sabotage inside Iran, for instance, then we should definitely raise our eyebrows, considering we know that the CIA has involved, been involved in this. And of course, the U.S. military right now is militarily occupying a rush, roughly a quarter of Syria's territory, sovereign Syrian territory in the northeastern part of Syria, which is where most of the country's oil and wheat is. And it, the U.S. military is 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 military, militarily occupying that Syrian territory in alliance with Kurdish militias backed by the U.S. So as an example, in the lead up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, these CIA backed Kurdish groups in Iraq they blew up a 90 car train and they also blew up the office of an Iraqi intelligence officer. And in this article, uh, uh, Jack Murphy quotes a hilarious thesis that was published by the U.S. Army Gener Major, U.S. Army Major Daniel Megan. And this was for his Naval Postgraduate School thesis, and it's titled breaking other people's toys, sabotage in a multipolar world. 
So you, you can bet the US military is, they understand that the US is now dealing with a multipolar world. It's no longer a unipolar world. And they are making plans to sabotage that multi, those other countries that make up the multipolar world. And in this thesis that he wrote, the US Army Major Daniel Megan wrote, quote, very small groups of saboteurs can have dramatic impacts on much larger enemy organizations. This utilization of small sabotage forces allowed leaders and planners to focus their limited manpower and materiel elsewhere while presenting their enemies with multiple dilemmas. So in his, his article, Jack Murphy points out that the U.S. government has met news of the mysterious fires and explosions in Russia with silence. But Ukraine has been goading the Kremlin on social media about the event, events, making fun of Russia as part of this, you know, psychological operations campaign or information warfare campaign. And since 2014, this former so-called former CIA officer said that U.S. intelligence started a robust training program for Ukrainian special operations forces, and they're also carrying out sabotage attacks inside Russian territory. While these acts of sabotage can have both a psychological and substantive impact on the Kremlin's offensive, they also run the risk of escalating conflict between the Western world and Russia beyond either side's ability to estimate or control. So this gets back to the comments that I began this analysis with, in which the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, warned very clearly that this war could potentially escalate into a full-on conventional conflict, conventional war between the U.S. and Russia. And here, Jack Murphy warns about this. He says, these strikes let leaders know that they can be hit in their backyard. And by the way, it's not just their backyard. It's their yard. It, it's their house. It's their house. It's their bathroom. It's their bedroom. The CIA is carrying out attacks inside Russian territory. And Jack Murphy points out that this could have a double effect of constraining Russia's military operations while also encouraging Putin to escalate the conflict further. So yes, it's a proxy war. And he says that as the war matured, the political implications of such operations frightened some governments. He doesn't know the same what they are, but maybe you, I'm thinking maybe Germany or France, which are trying to, in some ways, have, uh, you know, maybe de-escalate a little bit because they're worried about this escalation. On the other hand, the United States and its key NATO ally running the sabotage programs, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that it's Poland or a Baltic state, they have remained aggressive and forward leaning. The longer the war lasts, the more likely it is that the sabotage campaign will become more brazen. So this is the report by the US Special Operations Officer, Jack Murphy. He's now a journalist. And this report was killed by several mainstream media outlets that refused to publish it. And at the bottom of his article, he has a note he points out he said, many will ask why an article of this importance, is, this importance is appearing on my personal website rather than in a prestigious publication. He said that while working with editors at mainstream publications, I was asked to do things that were illegal and unethical in one instance. And in another instance, I felt that a senior CIA official was able to edit my article by making off the record statements before he leaked his story to the New York Times to undermine this piece. So the CIA was pressuring these mainstream media outlets not to publish this article that I was that I was analyzing and reading excerpts from today by Jack Murphy. He said, I don't begrudge the intelligence community for attempting to keep covert operations out of the newspapers. That's their job. However, I do blame the press for not fulfilling the most basic premise of their job. And here he criticizes mainstream journalists. I mean, he is a mainstream journalist, but other mainstream journalists for being too close to the CIA. He says, this article went through a vigorous fact-checking process and was deemed newsworthy as the strategic bombings of Laos and Cambodia or the CIA's secret drone campaign in Pakistan. Yet it never, it nearly never saw the light of day. And he criticizes journalists who become too close to the intelligence agency. So maybe this is some kind of, you know, uh, reverse psychology, 
uh, act of psychological operation targeting Russia. Maybe it's a limited hangout, but it's pretty clear that this is what's happening. It's very clear that the CIA has been working in supporting these forces in Ukraine to carry out a proxy war. That has been acknowledged in many mainstream media outlets, including the Washington Post, including multiple articles in the Washington Post, including the New York Times, including Yahoo News. All of this has been disclosed and we get more and more information as the, the drip of these leaks come out, comes out, come out. And of course, I will be continuing to report on and analyze these facts as they come out. And I think I'm going to conclude here because this is a very long episode. I, of course, in the description below, will link to an article at multipolarista.com that has all of the sources that I cited. And then, of course, I will also link to give credit to Jack Murphy for this important investigation that he published that was killed by the mainstream corporate media. I want to thank everyone for watching or listening to this program. I'll see you all next time.